I've overheard some of the some of the uh, comments about which academy is is better, and uh, you know I I thought about getting into that myself, but well, I tell you what you already know. <laughs> In all seriousness, what unites us far exceeds what separates us. Far exceeds. I'm a person that pays attention to numbers. And, and you know, today is a historic day for many reasons. August 28, 2010. Yes, it's the inaugural Black Service Academy Graduate Super Reunion. But it's also been exactly 47 years since Dr. King gave that great I Have a Dream speech here in, at the Washington at the Lincoln <laughs> 47 years. There was also a 47 year gap between the third graduate from a service academy and the fourth graduate of a service academy. Which speaks to me that we have some bridges to build. We can never neglect the bridges. So I, I just salute and thank the bridge builders in this room. I, I, I would be remiss because he, he's sitting right in front of me. One of those bridge builders is not an academy grad. He's actually my first boss uh, from, uh, after I graduated from the academy, I worked in the academy's minority admissions office. And I worked for a man there that had a vision for greatly expanding the number of minority cadets at the Air Force Academy. And he wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. He wasn't afraid to put his neck on the line. He wasn't afraid to be bold. The man I'm talking about is Ted Spencer, director of the As I said, we share a tremendous amount in common. We're at African Americans. We're all service academy grads that attended elite institutions that stress leadership, leadership development, and the development of the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. These institutions demanded far more than just going to school. I've been reading a, a, the autobiography of uh, another academy grad, class of 1980 from the Naval Academy, Montel Williams. And he, said, he says it interestingly, that going to a service academy isn't like going to an Ivy League institution. And having gone to an Ivy League institution, I can definitely relate to that. Because I've had a great many people ask me, well, what was tougher, the academy or Harvard Law School? <laughs> it wasn't even close. <laughs> it wasn't even close. The Ivy League schools pride themselves on graduation rates. The Academy, at least the Air Force Academy during my time, seemed to pride itself on how many they could get rid of. <laughs> Harvard felt or seemed to feel that we don't we got you in, so obviously you're qualified to be here, because if you weren't, we would have made mistakes. <laughs> And we don't make mistakes. <laughs> that is not the attitude of this nation's service academies. Coming to this event simply reminds me of the fact that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And I appreciate the sacrifices that have been made by so many people. And focusing in on what unites us and examining our theme, I prayed about a symbol that I could use that would speak to all of us for what this weekend, this reunion is all about. And the answer came back to me in the form of a person. I, I thought, of course, about Henry O. Flipper, the first black American to graduate from a service academy, West Point, class of 1877. <laughs> Thank you.
and not being negligent of my Air Force roots, I of course thought about General Benjamin O. Davis Jr., West Point Class of 36, first, second black American to be a general officer in the, in the military, and the first general officer, black general officer in the Air Force. But it wasn't him. The person, when I prayed, it came back to me so clearly. The person is Charles Young, West Point, class of 1989. Many of you don't know the story of Charles Young. So let me share just a little bit about him. He was a Renaissance man. He spoke several languages. He wrote two books. He was a musician, a composer. He was a friend and colleague of W.E.B. Du Bois and a friend of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He saw himself as a person who was proud of his race and proud of his country. He loved his country. He had a legacy of character. He was resilient and courageous. He was an outstanding public servant, a trailblazing mentor, and bridge builder. And he was a risk taker. He was born in 1864 in Kentucky to parents who had been slaves. After graduating from high school, he taught in a newly formed black high school. He took West Point's entrance exam and came in second place, so he wasn't able to go initially to West Point. But the first person dropped out quickly, and so Charles Young got the nomination and was appointed to West Point. He entered in 1884 along with the class of 1888. However, something that I can relate to, he failed math in his first year. As a result of that, he had to repeat his first year. So he fell back to the class of 1889. He was resilient. His career, yes, he did well in many subjects, but he also failed engineering in his first class year. As a result, he graduated late, and he graduated last in his class. Last in his class. Well, I'm somebody that flunked seventh semester chemistry. <laughs> I didn't have leave my first year. Ted Spencer will tell you, I was one of those folks that wasn't expected to graduate. I was one of those high-risk folks which causes me to just demur for a second. There is a professor at, a, at one of our naval, at the Naval Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Who argues that the academies are reducing their standards. I tell folks that I am a product, I'm a graduate of the Air Force Academy, largely because a lieutenant from the Minority Affairs office at the Air Force Academy, came to my high school where he spoke and then he started to follow up with me. I had to take the SAT five times in order to get a score high enough to qualify for the Air Force Academy. I did okay. 